Hello, and welcome to the Best and Worst Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Jake, and with me, as always, is my good co-host, Ian. I am Ian. And joining us, as per usual, is my my other all-right co-host, Mud. How you doing? I'm not Ian. What is this show, you might ask? Well, every week, the three of us idiots sit down and review a Best Picture winner over the past hundred or so years and determine if it's one of the best or worst pictures as compared to the others. This week, we're discussing the fourth Best Picture winner ever, Cimarron. Or, I don't know how to pronounce it. We'll find out. And to start us off, Mud has collected some fun facts about the film, which Ian and I have not heard ahead of time. Mud, take it away. Thank you. So, the film was released in 1931. It had its premiere date on January 26th, with a general release on February 9th. As for critic scores, though it was well received at the time of release, it currently boasts a 5.9 out of 10 on IMDb, 48% Rotten Tomatoes critic score, 25% audience score. Um, getting into it, though, it was directed by Wesley Ruggles, whose other work includes a film called No Man of Her Own, and I included that one solely because the lead is Clark Gable. Mm, We're going to be seeing a lot of him in the future, so I figured start now. <laughs> We've been pretending to see him in the past as well. Yes. Um, uh, here's a fun fact for you guys. He actually began his career as an actor in the silent film era and would occasionally work with Charlie Chaplin. Huh. That's cool. Yeah. I wonder what films. I'd like to watch them. Yeah. Um, the three leads that I've selected to discuss in this film are Richard Dix. Good. Irene Dune, and Estelle Taylor. Uh, Richard Dix is also known for the Ten Commandments film in 1923. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, the silent film. Yep. And he was actually born as Ernst Carlton Brimmer, which means he chose to change his name to, and I cannot stress this enough, Richard Dix. Dick Dix. Yep. Dick Dix. What a good name. Now, Irene Dune um, was also known for Theodora Goes Wild, The Awful Truth, Love Affair, and I Remember Mama. Why do they all sound like pornography films? I don't know. His I think Dick you Dix. need to get your na your head out of the gutter, Ian. You may be wondering why I chose those specific four films. Well, that's because those four films, along with this one, are films that Irene Dune was nominated for Best Actress in. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Five, Five nominations. Times. Five nominations. Uh, Did for... she win any of them? No. <laughs> Five noms, no wins. Um, after retiring from acting, she was actually chosen by President Dwight D. Eisenhower as a delegate for the United States to the United Nations. Wow. That's I know. She did a lot. And Holy I think she weird. was also the co-chair of Red Cross. I think I saw that somewhere in her life. That's That's one very of the, she's one of those people who's done a lot. That's got to be one of the biggest career changes I've ever seen. I know. And finally, we have Estelle Taylor, who was also in the Ten Commandments. Cool. Journalist Erskine Johnson Considered her, and I'm quoting, the screen's number one oomph girl of the 20s. What the? I don't know. So there's an it girl <laughs> and an, an oomph, oomph girl. girl. Yeah. Separate entities. We're finding out all the different types of girls there were. Yeah, black and white. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Gray. Unlike with it girl, where like there was a whole page explaining what it was, I clicked on oomph, and it took me to like wiki definitions of oomph. <laughs> And I was like, this, this is not helpful. Is, yeah. Not at all. This does not help me That's amazing. in any way, well, shape, or form. What would you expect, like an article about oomph? Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I'd think so. So, um, unfortunately, this is the second episode in a row where I couldn't find a way to link this movie to Mary Pickford because I wasn't trying too hard. But I did find out in 1926 she met with fascist dictator Benito Mussolini and was photographed giving a fascist salute. Thank God. What, Mary Pickford? Yes. That has nothing to do with the movie. It has most, nothing to do with the Most Pickford. interested in that. Yeah. That's going to be a new subcategory is I'm going to do a, a fun fact about Mary Pickford every Thank episode. God. I would be concerned if you didn't. Yeah. Um, so this film was released by RKO Radio Pictures. Okay. Um, King Kong, guys. Yeah. It's actually based on a book. So this mm. is our second adaptation in a row. And uh, it was a box office bomb. Yeah. This movie did, made well, uh, 10000 less than its budget or something? Yeah. There uh, is a correlation between bombs and Best Picture winners. There is. It, it had a monstrous budget at the time of release of $1.5 million. Adjusted for inflation, that is a $25.5 million okay. budget today, which is considered low budget. But you also need to remember how budgets have spiraled out of yep. controls mm -hmm. in the years since the superhero boom. Absolutely. It was also RKO's most expensive film. Some shots include up to 5,000 costumed extras. Jeez. 5,000. That's, That's crazy. A lot, that is yeah. an insane amount of people. Very positive reviews on release. Yep. Yeah. 6.4 out of 10 IMDb, 56% critic. Oh, my God. So we'll call it mixed. Let's say mixed. It was also the first Western to win Best Picture, considering it's the, the fourth other... ever. Yeah. And two of them are <laughs> war movies. Mm -hmm. And it would be the only Western Best Picture winner till 1990s Dances with Wolves. Yep. Wow. That's insane to me. And it got me thinking, because the 50s and 40s saw the Western boom. 
Well, think about it this way. We're in a superhero boom. And That's no, exactly what I those. thought about is yep. superhero yeah. movies are booming right now. And so far, none we've had one. one Best Picture nomination. Two, technically. What was the second one? Joker. That's not a superhero movie. It's based on comic books. The general movie going audience would consider mm-hmm. it one. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to tell me about the funnest fact of all, the only one I know? What's the only one you know? The movie has not aged well because it's uh, painfully racist. I mean, yeah, I think that was strongly implied yeah. by the reviews and the fact that it's a Western in the 30s. Oh, no. But it was <laughs> nominated in every Academy Award given out that year, with a few exceptions. All three. Well, actually, sorry, it was nine. It was nine. <laughs> That's still big. It was not nominated for Best Original Screenplay because, because it was it ineligible because yep. it's not an original screenplay. Yep. It also wasn't nominated in Best Sound Recording, but technicality... No movie was nominated, studios were nominated, and RKO Radio Sound was nominated. Okay. So through transitive property, okay. it was nominated Fair. in that category. That makes, sense. That. Yep. that makes sense. Yeah. It was not I would say it was nominated in every category it was able to get into. Yeah, because you can't be adapted and you can't original. be adapted and original. Yeah. You pick one. Uh it won three Academy Awards. The other two were Best Adaptation and Best Art Design, which is known today as Best Production Design. Cool. And it was a record at the time. Three wins. That's that's the <laughs> That's the that's the record. Three. Also a record. Seven nominations. Eight if we include RKO's production yep. house nomination. Mm-hmm. Um, Wesley Ruggles was nominated for best director and he lost, but he was nominated alongside Lewis Milestone, who directed last, last week's uh, yeah. video for the front page. Both of these films lost to Norman Torog for Skippy. Damn. Ah, uh, yeah. damn Skippy. <laughs> yeah. Skippy and Front Page were also Best Picture noms that lost to this film, obviously, obviously along with Trader Horn and East Lynn. This was also the first film to receive more than one acting nomination and the first film to receive nominations for The Big Five, which are Best Picture, Director, um, Screenplay, Adapted or Original, Best Actor, Best Actress. And it lost both of the acting ones. Mm-hmm. And it was also the only film to win multiple awards the year it came out. Nice. Okay. Makes sense. So it was the crowning achievement of that year. It was the crowning achievement of that year. Okay. Yep. Hopefully it's so good. So maybe it'll be good, but painfully racist. It's not going to be good. I am i don't have high hopes for this film. Going you don't have it. high hopes for Cinnamon? <laughs> Might be better than Broadway Melody. Yeah. I think it will be, considering Broadway Melody has a critical consensus, and it's like 30%. We also gave it threes across the board. Yeah, we did. That's 30%. Time for us to take the Cinnamon Challenge. <laughs> Fuck off. Wow, solid out-of-date joke. Got him. And we're back. Now, here's the thing. We all decided before we hit record just now after finishing the movie that we are going to save every element regards to how racist the movie is for the end. Because if we start at any point with that, we're there never going to get to... There's a lot to talk about. about yeah, the there's a lot to unpack there. We're, just, we're never going to get to the actual other points about like the movie that they're making, the acting, and stuff like that. We're just yeah. We're going to save every problematic part, which is a lot of it, for the end. So yeah. to start us off, who wants to say something relevant that isn't racist? Um, There's not I can much. Say something relevant. So the film's right. Ra- no, I'm kidding. Um, the plot isn't very compelling. I think um, it's muddled. There's so many like five, ten year jumps, and we're missing so much context in between. You're so right. The back half of this movie completely falls apart. Oh yeah, easily. Uh, okay, so we made the best picture show in hopes that we would just watch the best movie every year. Wow, I don't even think we've watched. <laughs> no, no, no. Last week's movie bumped. It did bump. All yeah. Quiet was awesome. Yeah, and Wings wasn't that bad. Yeah. The war movies so far have been great. Yep. Um, yeah. No, so let, uh, the movie at the beginning is focused. Like, I'd say the first half of this film is focused. It's about Yancey and his family moving to the uh, Lawless to the, West. The Lawless West. Done. And he through force of will, mm-hmm. is turning this town into civilization. Yep. And I like it. It's a hero's journey. He's not anything special. He's just this journalist who's trying to do right and bring law and order to this world, right? He's full of manifest destiny. Yes. But um, he wants to do it in, like, a real lawful way. Yeah. He's just a good guy with good goals. But once he starts leaving... Over and over, over again. Over and over again, the film just falls apart because it, yeah. it loses its focus. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be about after that. I think this is solely due to the reason that Yancey is the only interesting character in the whole movie. Kind of, yeah. I mean, what's another amazing thing another character did? Nothing. Nothing. That, like, 
that wasn't terrible. Everyone is in this film proxy in relation to Yancey. Yep. Everyone's even, importance is it, how they are related to Yancey. Even his wife, who's supposed to be a main character, I find her very, very bland. She's not got much to her beyond the fact that she really loves her husband and she's super racist. But yeah. we're not talking about that she part yet. She ends up becoming a governor and, like... I don't know how she gets there. I don't know how I'm supposed to care because it jumps 20 it years. It jumps 20 years. That cannot like, be undersold. I think that her character has nothing besides the fact that she's related to Yancey. This, it's the Not only marriage. does she jump 20 years, it jumps to the modern day. This film ends in 1929. Which is basically when it was Which filming. was the modern day yeah. for that, you know. Yep. I get. I think I get what they were trying to do is they were trying to parallel – some industries of the modern day to the wild west but it just doesn't work because you throw it in at such the last second and we o- we're only in the modern day for 10 minutes the last 10 minutes of the film like you could say how the um the oil boom is parallel to the wild west of how it was a kind of a it was lawless, a smash and grab it was a lawless smash and grab industry it was kind of like the gold rush mm-hmm. yeah the oil craze of like the, the 20s and 30s was a land like stepping on landmines it was fucking insane. It was like the gold rush where everyone wanted to go in there. Everyone wanted to get it. Everyone wanted part of the business. They didn't do any of that. Yeah. They didn't even focus on the gold rush either. They didn't give themselves enough time to do that. Yeah. It's weird because it presents itself as a sweeping 40-year epic, but it skips over so many of those years yep. in order to call itself a 40-year epic. I feel like we miss all of the important things that happen to the characters. The kids aren't really there. The kids they just, don't get to be kids. They just grow up. The character of this film is named after Cimarron? Cimarron? Yep. Mm-hmm. Not in the movie. Not in the movie. He is Yancey's son. Yep. He has no. He has nothing. He falls in love with a Native American woman. I don't know why. There's something that you could say there, and they just didn't say it. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, the only reason that that is part of the story is because of the racist mom, which I guess is a character arc, but we'll get there at the end of the talk. But um, but I don't understand how... Do you guys remember The Magnificent Seven? Yes. Oh, yes. When the young kid falls in love with the uh, girl in town? Yep. It's got hardcore, they are a man and woman on screen together, they must fall in love energy. That's yep. exactly what Cimarron and Ruby have. I agree is completely. There's, there's nothing to them. It's surface level. It's the fact that they are a man and a woman near each other. And again, this does, technically is not a racist element, but no. so I can talk about it now. But her character arc is that by the end of the film, she actually approves of the daughter-in-law being an Indian person. I think... Which is I, not true because she's Native American. They keep calling her Indian, which is really annoying. That's a That's a... Yeah, that's, that's a, a that's thing. a small hill. Small hill I know, thing. I know. But, but what m- my problem is that what caused her to change from a frothing racist to someone who accepts her? Maybe something over the twenty years. Well, yep. you see, there was twelve years of growth between nineteen oh seven and nineteen twenty nine, which is the jump. In the beginning of the film, it's small jumps. It's three years, five years, which is still a significant yeah, portion of time. Jump, Don't get it's me not wrong. Twenty two years from nineteen oh seven to nineteen twenty nine. It's not twelve years. From 98 to 07, and then from 07 to 29. Yeah, that's a huge jump. But what I'm saying yeah. at the beginning of the film, from 1990 to 1993, isn't... Or, yeah, from 1890... Comparatively, it's a small from jump. From 1890 to 1893, that's not that Even bad technologically, of a jump. it's such a small jump. The early 1900s are like small village-like area, and then it was big, booming city. The end of the 18th century is one of the strangest times in modern history, because you've got... The Wild West in America, you've got the Industrial Revolution in England, the end of one of the periods in Japan, yep. um, I think the end of the Royal Period in France. Like The time between 1880 and 1910 is probably the strangest 30-year gap in terms of global history, yep. because everything just fucking rolled over. Because even our Industrial Revolution was there at that point, yep. in that 30 years. Like In 30 years, we went from lawless cowboys to... Almost modern society. Almost modern society. I would also say that those time skips in the first half of the movie are not detrimental to the story. No, no. they they're, serve a purpose. They're perfectly yep. fine, and you can totally flow from one time jump to the next because it's only like a few years, like you were saying. But it doesn't grind the movie to a halt or completely miss character arcs or stuff like that. And then the last half of the movie is just riddled with like first like a, what, a ten year one and then a twenty year one or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it just it keeps jumping with these massive like chunks of a human lifetime that you're just completely blind to and you know what the thing i want to talk about is i think every time jump besides the three-year time jump fucks the movie up mm-hmm. even the five-year one where he goes away to the war he goes to the cherokee strip and i believe is a part of the spanish-american war and they just completely gloss over it and nothing gets said about it 
Mm-hmm. There are so many metaphors and allegories and things that you can do with this movie that just are glossed over. Mm. Everything's glossed over. He has that one really, really good line in the church about how he understands why the Cherokees don't donate because the white man took their land. Yeah. And it's such powerful. That's a powerful part. And you understand Yancey as a character of, no. That was the scene in this right. movie where I was like, okay, there is something to this film. Yep. And then they gloss over it for the rest of the movie. Except when he says, I care about my son. We can't dictate his life. He can do what he wants. I think the problem with this film is Yancey is a character. Yes, he's I the feel only that character. He has motivations. He has drive. He has an arc. Mm-hmm. I understand him. Yep. So the problem is when there's still 40 minutes left and you start taking him away repeatedly and we are left uh, flailing with the supporting cast to try to get any sort of story together, it doesn't work. No, not at all. If Yancey's not in this film, the movie's bad. This film relies on Yancey entirely to make it I think he's an awesome character. He is. He's badass. This man is the motivation, like the motivation to get this town together. Also, excuse me, but uh, dual wielding, therefore yes. 10. He dual wields and fights. We have an unspoken like, rule in the show. If someone dual wields on screen, it's automatically a 10 out of 10. Yeah. So like, just saying. He, he's a man of action. He's a man of law. He's a man of order. And this movie does a really, really good job in showing that. He has the white cowboy hat on for the first part of the movie where everyone else has the tan cowboy hat, the gray ones, the black ones. He represents, like, it's the good. outer purity. This, and once it gets shot, he stops wearing it. Basically. This film had this film had color theory without color. Which yep. is really cool. That's impressive. It was stark white. It looked like yep. it was giving the cameras issues because it was so bright on screen it's, that it was overpowering. Yeah, I also liked how, like, the scenes where he still had it on, you see it slowly get dirtied. Indicating mm-hmm. that he's no longer it's, as pure as he or was. Or he'd start taking it off and taking not wearing it, it holding it more. And also when he did have it on, he had that bullet hole right at his skull. I think that's pretty It's good symbolism. At the yep. very least, it's visually engaging as far yep. as your themes. I would argue it's a visual interpretation of what his character is, which is yeah. like, he is the white knight, but he isn't afraid of violence. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because there are scenes, there's a shootout scene in this film. Yancey jumps right into it. He oh, goes yeah. at it. Oh, yeah. He kills people. That was awesome. It was an amazing action scene. There are definitely yeah. some elements in here that will be done better in the Dollars trilogy. You can see some like classic cliche. I made a note. This, this feels like this feels like a foundation of right. the Western genre. Like there are so many cliches and tropes in this film. You know, like the 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 stranger from out of town coming right. to the lawless land where and this cousin. one gang controls everything right, right, exactly. immediately challenge. like this feels like the proto western <laughs> the, the problem the is revive. it's not really a problem but the the situation is that mm-hmm. it doesn't have Sh- sergio leone's trademark tension building which no. builds up the same scene over and over with like the the music slowly building and crescendoing with the shootout after like a yep. long time that was kind of quote quote invented with the Dollars trilogy. It was like done in that way, yeah, and made that a popular thing. So this movie being way before that, not having that seems kind of weird. And I keep watching this and going, "Wow, I sure wish it had some kind of tension." Because then instead of tension, people just pulled out their guns and shot each other. It yeah. just it was over in like an instant, which I guess I it mean, would be okay. They but also, that's realistic. Can I just say they also all fired from their hip with like really limp wrists, <laughs> which yeah. was really fucking yeah, funny. Was really hilarious. Like they didn't even they did not aim like their hand, their arms were up against their torsos when they fired their gun. Mm-hmm. It was like Jesus Christ, you're right. not even trying to look like a real cowboy. No, not at all. Right. But um, yeah, this film had a lot of what I felt like. It's not. It's not completely Western because we talked about those time skips. So obviously the last half of this film is modern day. Mm -hmm. But like the first half of this film when it's really in the West. I think that's the more interesting part. It's definitely the more interesting part. It feels like it feels like Seven Samurai in a sense where I feel like I'm watching like every film in a good way. You know what I mean? Though, Like I feel like I'm watching these movies. Yeah. And you make a good point about the Western will obviously be refined over the years to be good. What we get with Sergio Leone and the fucking dollars trilogy and even later westerns like like unforgiven which we will watch for this uh yes we will you know i'm excited and even i'd say magnificent seven is a better western than this but like yeah yep everything has to start somewhere yeah and this is a really good stepping off point i really feel like this is 
there's some really good scenes. I really like the church scene overall. Yeah, the entire yeah, thing is the I think great. that might be the best scene. It's got movie. great comedy. It's got great tension. It's got great themes and messages. We were talking about it. There's a scene. To get a little into it, I know we don't want to talk. We have a lot to say about the racism in this film. But to get a little into it, one of the guys in the church complains that the Cherokee Indians who are uh, there. Yeah, I know. I said Indians, not Native Americans. It's fine. I guess just the Cherokees yeah. um, who are there are not donating to the to the till and one of the white guys is like why aren't they donating and yancey's like well we kicked them off their land and they don't really they don't want to fund the people who took everything from them yeah and it's there's also some good humor in that scene because like at the beginning yancey gives like his intro and he's like welcome to the baptist methodist protestant christian catholic hebrew Hebrew church Church. yeah (laughs) there's a lot of really good beats in that scene it, it it's it's a good microcosm of like the idea of like society forming of itself when there's no outside factors, you know, not everyone can get their own church in town. So they set up a, a big church and it's like, mm-hmm. well, everyone can attend. I also you know? like the idea of this rinky dink kind of nothing village being not taken, but formed by this one man over his lifetime into a prosperous, good, cool village. A lot of that was because of the oil boom. And there's oil in that village. I get that. But a lot of what that man did, Yancey did to construct and build this town basically from the ground up into a prosperous type of city is really interesting to me. And those parts of the movie, which there weren't a whole lot of, yep. were really cool to me, and I love that part. And if a lot of that had focused on that, that would have been awesome. I think that the scene in the church particularly is interesting for me because that's like right while America was becoming the melting pot that it is. Yep. So I feel like it doesn't age well because of how we view, well, how American society as a whole views that things like that now where imagine if someone right now petitioned for an all religions church and how much fucking uproar and backlash that would have it wouldn't necessarily be uproar as it would be just laughed out of the room no like, one would consider i think it. people would get mad people i think i mad. think it would i think you're attacking christianity that would be that the would thing. be that would be part of it but i do agree with your assessment jake of some people would be like that's fucking stupid well also let's the reason why i think it would be laughed out of the room is because no one of any religion would go there they'd go to their own religious church yeah we already have plenty yes. of religious there's no omni religious and it wasn't like it to. wasn't like it was like decreed by law by like yeah. a state governor like we need a monomyth church it was just we hey, need, this would be convenient. We need a place to worship. Yeah, yeah. it was. It was in a tent. It, it was in a tent, I, and it's supposed to reflect how these these towns come together as a society yep. mm-hmm. and work together out on the frontier, where there's no one but each other to rely on. And yep. that's really good theme and imagery. Like yep. that. That's what this film should be about. Is like people being able to put their differences aside because they do kind of get into that with the mother realizing, oh, I'm a terrible racist. Yeah, she realizes it off screen. Yeah, but Yeah, I know, I know. There's I'm problems just... with like it saying and having good themes about unity and equality given the dissonance of everything else in the movie. Uh, we'll we can to. talk. There's a certain character it's, named oh, yeah. Isaiah who we will talk ad nauseum about. Yes, we will. So, oh, I have a lot so Jake mentioned the Sergio Leone music building tension. The ADR and folly in this film is dog shit. Especially <laughs> at the beginning. Oh my Let's God. talk about the opening scene. The opening scene is so bad. The opening scene is irrelevant. Let me. You add... can start the movie with him having dinner with his family. Yep. Well, I do have something positive to say about the opening scene. I re- well, actually, before the scene... I miss when movies had the actors one by one showed up on screen to introduce their characters. That was very fun. Each actor popped yeah. up on screen. Yeah, I like the, the little character intros. That's cool. It's a like this you actor. know who it is. Like this actor as this character, so it's informative and also interesting to watch. Yeah, I like yeah. That. But just like Wings with the opening scene, I really appreciate how the elaborate carriage running sequences must have like been filmed in that time period. Oh, Again, 5,000 costume yeah. that, extras. Dude, the scene looked phenomenal. You can it tell did. it wasn't rear projection in a lot of that because it, some idiots were falling over themselves in the background. Oh my god. There were scenes of like horses running away from each other and snapping their bracers. Right? There were carts just being dragged along the ground. I was like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, it was awesome. It added a layer of chaoticness to the scene. So yeah, I really well, I mean, that's what that's what the Western settlement was. That's, it was yeah. pure chaos. It was a right? rush, man. It was awesome. It was unbridled manifest destiny. They just mm-hmm. had to manifest all over the goddamn West. It was technically visually great, but like it was five minutes of B-roll, woo and yeah. 
For, yes. Yeah. It it I'll went on that. it went on yeah. way too long. It went on really long and I wrote hooping and hollering. Yeah, that that's a perfect way to sum it up. The horse noises that were yeah. being made. It was like a, a a playful trot and the horses are like sprinting across the screen. You can very clearly see the horse like opening its mouth and, and like neighing and, like, and yeah. there's no noise. Yep, yep. Um the ADR throughout the film's bad. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh there's a scene, I forget exactly what happens. I noted it though. Uh I think one of the guys like cocks his gun and there's no noise. Yep, yep. He yep. I think it was in the church where he goes like this and cocks back and nothing. No, yeah, nothing. there was no noise. Not yep. even like a little like... Shh. Adding to that, there was a scene where someone tried to pour something down someone's throat and nothing came out of the bottle and they pretended like there was something out of oh, the yeah, bottle. Oh yeah, the prop the prop work in this film is yeah. not yeah. the best either. On par with like a theater. I would still argue we're still in the theater age of oh, film. There's some good. There's some good shots in this film though. There was a really nice mm-hmm. overhead shot of like mm-hmm. people coming down a street riding horses. There was right. some good cinematography. The opening B-roll has good cinematography. It's just painfully long and annoying. It just gets old. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep. I would say my main problem that isn't about racism with this movie <laughs> is that a lot of the scenes are irrelevant to the story. Oh yeah. There are so many vignettes. Where side characters have full blown sequences that add absolutely nothing to the movie, Agreed. and it pisses me off when I like the story and the premise, like I was saying earlier, of this one man basically finding an entire village, as in founding it from the ground up, basically turning this nothing town into this 1929 modernized era. Yeah, and him be- taking like basically all of that what's here, and sure, getting lucky with the oil rush, but on top of that becoming basically the founder that he's like the head of the editor paper he's head of the church he's you hear the about governor. these kind of guys in in history where they right. found like whole states or whole towns you that's know so interesting that's really to me. interesting to me yeah. and he was a compelling character right. he had a lot to say about like fairness and equality he he did have those themes mm-hmm. in him he was like you know like hey maybe we shouldn't treat the cherokees like shit right you but know the problem is i would argue that between 20 and 30 minutes of this movie is him actually doing that yeah. The rest is all this awful fluff, and I know we're not at racism yet, but it's that, and it's all these side characters that do nothing and add nothing. It's amazing how the first part of this film, which is the best part of the film, is so good and so thematically on point and so interesting, I would argue, and it's bogged down by just blatantly racist things. I know. I know we're not getting into it, but and then the second half of the film is just boring as shit. We, we but, keep saying we're not getting into it because it's hard not to mention it when talking about yeah, it. Yeah, but like if we start talking about it, we're going to lose any point we, we were are. trying to make prior. Absolutely. But I want to get into I want to get into something. Ian, uh, oh, yeah. you said that the opening scene is there to establish Dixie Lee. <laughs> She doesn't fucking matter. She doesn't. She, doesn't fucking she does matter. not fucking nope. matter. So Dixie Mud, Lee. Mud highlighted these three people in the opening, and one of them's in five minutes of the movie. Yep. To be fair, on Wikipedia, I just grabbed the top three actors listed, so I figure that's main guy, main girl, and like most nope. important supporting. Nope. I probably should have grabbed. <laughs> Actually, I don't know who else I would have grabbed. Lon Yundis. Yeah, who did he play? Um, he was the character. That was the bad guy that got shot. Yeah, for the first forty minutes of the film. Yes, I like outside when, of uh, Yancey and his wife. There's really no one I could have grabbed to be like, oh, this is the other important character. Yeah. I like when Mud looks up fun facts before seeing it. So after seeing it, we can go, oh, that fun fact actually doesn't. We, we can add a level to it that wasn't yeah. there yeah. prior. But so Dixie Lee is a prostitute. I was waiting for you to talk more than I that. Felt, I, I don't know. I looked into Ian's dreamy <laughs> eyes and I forgot what I was going to say. I don't it happens think, all the time. I don't think no, she was so a prostitute, thinks, was she? I, I think it said she was a prostitute on the no, weekend. No, she, had a, he, she had a husband and She's then a baby and then he died. The point is Dixie Lee is a working girl who is like on trial at one point in the film. And I think Yancey defends her. He does. I don't know why. Like, I get that Yancey is like he, great. She at, robbed him. Yeah, she did rob him of his land, which again... Still irrelevant, even if you want to keep Dixie Lee in the film. You don't need that prior connection. But two, Yancey is not a lawyer. He is a newspaper editor. And I just got to, like, that was the one part where I was like, all right, this is bullshit. He needs to stop being everything to this He's town. Yancey every job. He's is Yancey. That, like, he's Joe working, man. See, he's just also, got every fucking job under the sun. See, I don't know. I kind of buy it because back in that time period, they had like no regulations on anything. Yeah. So I buy it. It's just uh, dumb. One man, hypothetically, if he had the power, could in theory become head of like seven or eight different branches of this man. town because no one else really is. See, my my favorite thing about fucking the Dixie, the, the Dixie Chicks side plot is is like it definitely doesn't matter because she's not established no other character besides even lon main bad guy the first 45 minutes he has maybe three scenes he shows up is an asshole 
And then Yancey goes, scream yep. at him, which I wrote down because it was just, that scene was absolutely stupid. Like the scene where he shoots at the guy for no reason, makes him drink alcohol, and Yancey's like, oh, you want to know my opinion? Scream! And I'm like, even the main villain for the first 45 minutes doesn't really have anything. He's just kind of a He's just bandit. a stereotypical, you bandit know, bad asshole. guy Western yeah. man. Oh, can I talk about the bandits real quick? Yep. The of whole town, like, there's, there's a, okay, so there's a line in there where the, I believe the wife is like, well, we're proud of what you've done, getting rid of those bandits and outlaws. Yancey straight up murders several people without consequence and is not reprimanded about it. In because any they're way, bad guys. What? Okay, but I'm sorry, but those outlaws and bandits in the context of the movie were probably just civilians living there. And they might have had families or children and they were just never addressed. But because he's the hero and they're the evil guys, they got to be shot dead. And it's like, come, like you're not going to add any more characters. I'm going to tell you, though, the second group of people that he killed besides Lon. Lon did live there. And he was just being an asshole. Yep. That second group of people came into town and was were shooting the They were the gunning bank. people down. They were shooting I, the I, bank. I, that's fine. Yeah. That's all well and good. But the problem is that Yancey's body count is pretty freaking high to be a respectable top tier member of society. I mean, it's probably because he invented the society. This is his town. He this gets. Town. To, I get to kill people. This is my town. I get to execute who I want. I'm judge, jury, and drug executioner. Yeah. Come here, weird face lady. Yeah, there's a name for that type of dictator. <laughs> but whatever. It's just it really stood out as really bizarre to me that the movie would paint him as like a heroic man by just murdering everyone. I'm not surprised that this film didn't really exactly get into the morals of taking a life. It didn't even get into the morals of the Dixie situation, how he felt like I thought it was interesting at first, how he even though she stole his horse at the beginning of the movie, how he's like, I'm gonna defend this bitch in court. Like mm -hmm. also that was like Ten years ago at that point. Yeah. Does he even remember her? Probably. He remembers everything. Dude, oh, I have the biggest pet peeve in this whole movie for me. At the beginning, when he's camping with his wife before they get there, a bandit cowboy, I think it was the kid, it was the raids kid. him. And he just happens to know the cowboy. I was I, pissed. I saw that, and I was like, how? Yep. How did he know this guy? Out of every single cowboy in the whole world, this is the one that ends up in the Yancey's I'll camp. do you one better. How does he know any cowboys? Mm -hmm. He served with them in Lake or something. He he spoke a dialogue line, a throwaway dialogue line about it, because uh, he he kills them later on in the movie. Yep, and it's weird because some throwaway dialogue lines are actually really good. Like there's some good callbacks to some of the lines. Yeah. Like oh, I've never been here for more than five years. Versus the guy at the end who's like I've never been here for more than forty years or something. Yeah, like that. as long as I've stayed anywhere. Yeah, long. Yeah, that's what it was. That was really good and really cool and thematic. Like there's there's little sprinkles of really cool thematic elements in here yeah. and i feel like the movie could be actually great and it isn't yep it's the inklings of a good movie again yep. same with wings inklings of a great movie although wings i would rate positively i don't know about this one i this... would rate this film positively yeah we'll get there i'd rate it similarly um okay let me look it's a mid yeah. Well, well, uh, this film's I, mid. Well, let's let's go over our last not racist points. I I don't know. I oh I'm sorry. Last not racist point. Sorry, I thought you were saying let's get into it. No, I like the race, say, no, I not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, the time skips in this movie are definitely to its deficit, especially when they just start getting like exponentially longer. Yeah, because oh, you're skipping so many important points in these characters' Speaking lives. Speaking of time management. He just so happens to die at the exact last moment in which he arrived back home. Not any year prior when he was away in the 20-year gap. No, year I, gap. he wasn't home. Not on the way over. Not even 10 minutes later after he has that. His wife speech. just happened to be he there. He just happened, happened to, to die right as his Freaking wife showed up. The exact moment he's yeah. in her arms, he's like, oh, cool, better die. Like, <laughs> fucking, what a chance. Like, it wasn't like... Like, even if he was established to be dying prior, which he really kind of wasn't, but even if he was, why would that line up in that exact moment to have, like, a minute left with yeah. your wife to talk? Like, that's it was so dumb. annoying. Also, it does kind of detract, because, like, at the end of the movie, Yance is kind of old and broken, and it's like, what was he doing out here? I don't understand anymore. Because at first, it seemed like he was bending this town to his will and, like, shaping a society with him at the center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether he wanted to be that center or not yeah. was a little ambiguous, well, he has I would argue. Wanderlust. He goes he does have everywhere that there's yep. stuff. See, but that's the problem, I think, is, like, that's the deficit of the 12-year time skips is, like, so they just haven't talked to him? Get a fucking divorce lawyer. Yeah. This dude's skipping out on you. Hey, there's a lawyer in town. He's got papers. And here's the here's the best part. How much money does Yancey have? Because he's running for governor at one point, and that plot goes nowhere. Yeah, yeah. it goes nowhere. His this wife... guy's probably rich. Like he kind of owns. And his wife this... gets to be the governor. And he's he kind of owns this town. Like it just 
it, there's there's in, there's a lot of inconsistencies at the end of the film that feels like it's just them trying to speed run to the end. They're yep. just doing quick time skips to move the plot along for the sake of convenience rather than actually this is when something narratively relevant happens. Yep. Which is why the final 20 year skip just leaves you feeling so fucking empty. Mm-hmm. Wait uh, a second. 1907 to 1929. 22 years. That's yeah. That's 22 years. We said 12 years. You early. said 12 years. I said 12 years. I said no. Yeah, that's 22. 22 years. Fuck. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I'm doing bad math today. It's fine. Yeah. It's all you're well good. You're good. Yeah, that's God. She's like that's his you. wife. You are 22. I am 22. If I was born, it time skipped the whole mud, <laughs> the entire one mud. <laughs> it's that's like amazing. God damn. She must be in her 60s. His maybe wife. Maybe 70s. Maybe 70s. And she looks great. Yep. Like, the, well, her makeup is pretty bad. Her makeup's awful. His was great. She, that's what bothers me. Is she just looks like a blonde? You know, blondes when you film them in black and light, it looks like they're almost indistinguishable from someone with gray hair. Yep. Because it's just a light color, and light color comes through as kind of grayish. Yep. She just looked like she dyed her hair blonde and had some bags under her eyes. It's like, oh, just get some sleep. Yep. If you get some sleep, you'll de-age twenty years, my lady. I mean, she didn't age twenty years, so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. Actually, to peel back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes here, uh, we do obviously don't do commentaries on the best picture movies. We kind of just hang out. I wish we did. If we I were to, there are some select sequences during some best picture movies where we would just have some we are good still, times. We, we are still cracking jokes as if we were doing commentary. It's hard to turn it off. It's through last week we were bad. <laughs> oh, my God. It was great. It's fantastic. But what what is what it allows us to do is we do have longer periods of quiet, and there's less anxiety to be like, I got to say something funny because this yep. is 10 minutes worth of film that's not. I never have anxiety. I'm always funny. Do we have any more nope. side notes before we talk about None. the last thing? Can I open the... Um, the oh, I, open I got one more thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yancey gets shot in the arm, through the arm. Yep. You see blood on both sides of his uh, upper arm. Yep. And he's able to, like, carry shit in the he next He carried year. a kid. He, he carried a dead body. He didn't even have bandages on the wound. Yep. I'm like, dude, your arm's done. It should just be hanging there. Yep. Like, mm. you got shot through. Through the arm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think that's just about everything I have to say dancing around our main subject. Let okay, me just... cool. You know what else was shit? The blatant racism. The blatant so racism. I, I want to open this up. Yeah, um, all yours, buddy. Let's go. Isaiah is the first character of color in any Best Picture movie that we've watched. Is that true? Yeah. Huh, I didn't think about I that. I can't think of... I genuinely can't think of a black character in Quiet... Broadway or Wings. So we get the first character of color at all, basically. Sure. And in... he's he's in the movie. Yeah. Like he's, he's not just in a the little first like 40 minutes. he's not just in the background. He's a supporting character. So the first character of color we get is a racist caricature of a person. Yep. The second the screen opens up and it's going through the characters, the little intros that we thought were nice and cute. Every other character has like a gun and they're doing all of these things and they're like oh i'm badass i'm yancey or like and then it goes to isaiah and it's he's shining a fucking shoe and i'm like oh no yep and then the first scene he's like in the rafters with a feather duster and he's like mess and i'm like oh no the best part is this is post-civil war so he's not a slave yep he is just a caricature i want to add something else too more of a question and even blatant horrible racism aside, as a character, what was Isaiah's purpose in the story? I don't. I think he was no. supposed to technically be comedic relief. Oh god, I, I disagree. Think you're right. Well, I might agree. I guess that's what they're trying to do. But the thing is, he adds nothing, does nothing, says nothing that isn't a racist uh, caricature. Well, he all he also dies going out to protect Cimarron. Cimarron? Cimarron? S- no, Yancey. No, he. The kid is out. She goes, oh, my God, Cimarron. He goes, I'll get him. And then he doesn't. And then he goes, and he's about two yards away, and he gets shot. Yeah. And he, the worst part is he does not die from that. Later nope. on, it is established. I think Yancey walks by him, yep. and, like, he weakly calls out for him. But like, he can't hear him. Help me. He can't hear and him. And then he dies. Yep. And it's so frustrating because Isaiah could have been – an amazing character. Yep. Especially with what Yancey was talking about like in the church. Y- Yancey the, is such an advocate for Cherokees and like everyone being treated equally out here on the front. And I, everyone in this town is white. 
Yep. Let me be fucking clear about that. Or Isaiah in, or native or native. Isaiah is quite literally the only black person in this film. Yep. And it's just it's it's so frustrating to see all these scenes like when when they find out he stowed away, he does the down on both knees. Oh, please don't make me go back, Massa. Like that voice. And, but the thing no, is No, I'm not done. At the very beginning of the film, he falls out of this weird like contraption he's sitting on above the the family. Hits the cake, right? Oh, it's funny. He has cake on his butt. And the most blatant mammy stereotype comes out and starts spanking him. And it's like, oh, get back in the kid. It's just like, oh, my fucking. It's really bad. And it just, it's so bad because Isaiah joins Yancey in the West. And they are actually nice people to him. Yeah, Isaiah and his wife. Like, there's a scene where Yancey, like, when he's starting to get in trouble with the bandits, he hands Isaiah a gun and he goes, hey, go back to the house. And if anyone tries to break in, shoot them. Yep. Like cool he trusts isaiah you know like he treats him as an equal in that scene yeah and it's just so frustrating that isaiah gets no payoff he yeah. he's just this because he sacrifices character. himself for their son for their son and he just dies and they just, never mention it again I was about they to, never was talk about it that was my point i'm pretty sure and i paid the fuck attention for that i'm pretty sure they did not mourn or feel bad about isaiah dying for his son at any point after that he died no. at no. any point in the movie Mm-mm. and that was really annoying because like if what you're saying is true yes he did treat him as an equal in that scene he gave him a gun he trusts isaiah to a certain extent but the problem is if you trust that character so much it's like if indiana jones watched short round die and then didn't care at the end of the movie Oh, yeah. Like, that'd be huge for Indiana Jones if it's that happened. It's so tough because, like, oh, in that scene, when they find out Isaiah's dead, like, two seconds before that, he says something along the lines of, what if that had happened to you? The kids, him, and um, Stutter Guy. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. He said all three of those things and didn't say Isaiah. And it did happen to Isaiah. And they walk in with Isaiah's dead body. It's like they weren't even concerned. Nope. Yep. Yeah, and then the rest of the film is all about, like, quasi-politics. It's not even about and Isaiah. It's, it's frustrating, because then you have that scene of Yancey being all like, Cherokees need to be treated equally. And, like, the whole po- the climax of the film is Yancey's wife accepting that his uh, is, her son is, da- is going to marry a Cherokee woman. Yep. Uh, they're already married at that point, but yeah. I know. It's just, like, this film has no, like, sense of, like, it's not self-aware. It doesn't read the room. It's not yeah. self-aware at all. Where it's like, hey, if you're going to do this whole positive message about, like, Cherokees and Native Americans to an extent, maybe also throw something the way of the one black character you have in the film. You went out of your way to add this character. You know, you absolutely don't need Isaiah in the film because guess what? He doesn't really contribute anything to the narrative. And that was my big point. Like, he has no purpose in the story. He doesn't add anything to anything. He could have easily, if you had rewritten the ending or parts no, of the, just, after the movie. No, just make them mourn the kid, man. Yeah, make That's him mourn it. him at all. Add a scene or two or several because he deserves several scenes where they're talking and or reflecting on Isaiah's death. Then his character becomes a little more impactful. They didn't have a funeral. Yeah, not even a funeral. Even though he's supposed to be, like, this amazing, trustworthy character. Which is weird because he toes the line from a well-written character who actually helps the main characters out and actually, like, is trusted by them. And an incredibly awful, offensive, terrible, racist stereotype. That's what I'm saying. Isaiah is so close to being a great character. I I would argue he's still the second best character in the film. Yeah, he is. I would would support that argument if he... Because he, he gets to do stuff. He does. He's given a lot. He's given a lot. Whether or not the writing is good is uh, uh, objective no. But like, <laughs> at least he does things. One of my biggest issues in this entire film is that the racism is, isn't is like written in per se. It's just the dialogue. Yep. It's not like a exploration. It's just... Racism exists. Yes, it's not. Well, it it exists, and we are unintentionally making it exist. Yep. And it's tough because there are Best Picture winners like 12 Years a Slave that portray that kind of environment. I know it's not slavery necessarily in 12 Years a Slave is slavery. No, Cimarron as well. Oh, I'm sorry. They're not talking about slaves. The point is there are great Best Picture films that comment on race. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And this... The racism isn't a commentary. It's just the fact that this film was made in 1931. It's the dressings. This is a great example of a film that, like, white people make to get over their own, like, guilt about maybe being racist. Where oh, it's is like, that Green Book? Yeah. Oh, look. Look at us. We're making a movie where the cowboy wants the Native Americans to be treated equally. Also, his black servant <laughs> dies, and he's not sad about it. Did you know that they would have voted for Obama if they were given a third term? Anyways, give us your body. <laughs> 
<laughs> How about some fucking self awareness, my guy? I'm so mad. Yeah, no, this like, film, this film is just completely, completely held down. Jake, I don't remember what review you said of said this in, but it's like a biplane with an anchor yep. strapped to the tail. Yeah, you're gonna get some altitude, but you're gonna go nowhere significant because the they're end. ignoring the major problem that's keeping them down yeah. the whole time. Yeah. You are treating the one black character as a fucking punchline the entire time. Yep. And then you're going to turn around and say the point of this movie is being nicer to Cherokees. Yeah. Dude, the message of the movie is equality. Can you get over that? That's the theme is everyone should work together equally. Not only just in yeah. like, not only in racism, but in sexism. Because at yeah. the end of the movie, his She's wife governor. is yep. governor of a women state in 1929. <laughs> yeah, the the right for women to vote was a brand new fucking thing at the time. What, yep. Wasn't it the, like 1910s or something? Yeah, somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact uh, the year. The suffragette movement was the early 1900s. Right around 1915. It was, was also the, like a movement. It took a long time. It wasn't like a day. It's just so frustrating. And then you have like their stuttering uh, print guy and Isaiah. That's like his main posse. You know, there are scenes that establish that Yancey trusts Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Like not as a servant, but as an equal. You know, giving this kid... I cannot stress this enough. He gives the kid a gun and tells him to shoot anyone that tries to break in. That is above just, you work for me. This is, I trust you. Yep. Also, you know? to, to piggyback off the starter character, uh, this isn't about race at all. But I liked how that character's in the movie and they didn't make fun of him a lot. They it's weird that scene. this is the second best picture winner to have a character with a stutter. I don't know. It's just it's a weird character tick that keeps popping up. The problem was, uh, what was the other one? Broadway? Broadway. Broadway. They kept making fun of them. The, yeah, the problem was they kept making fun of them in Broadway. But this one, They're... they had one joke where it's a song where he tried to sing <laughs> and it was like a remix. So I do want to point out, the women, women got partial voting rights in 1920 <laughs> and full voting rights in 1965. Hey, yeah, so uh, what the movie is saying is nine years, not even a full decade after partial voting rights, she's governor of... Oklahoma. Not like a progressive state. Oklahoma. Yep. Especially in that time period, too. Not even like now. Like just then. Yeah. So nine years removed from women being able Less to vote than in the 19th a decade. Yep. And you're telling me you have a female governor. Yep. And they don't explore anything with it. It's very blatant. Even. It's amazing. This film has fantastic setup and then just <laughs> no manages pain. to go nowhere for 40 minutes. Yep. Honestly, it's, it's a shame because I think without the race the movie's actually not that bad no i liked it i'm inclined to agree like, i just can't give it a positive score i know we're probably going to disagree on the score of the movie but like i for me since a lot of the themes and elements the movie was building undercut to, like since a lot of them they're going for are completely dissonant and conflicting to the fact that it's incredibly racist to, to me that just completely undercuts the whole thing because like now all of your themes of like uh oh, rags to riches you know work together all this shit that is completely irrelevant when Isaiah happens. The best scene in the movie is undercut. I think this movie has something going for it. It is amazing how this film is so close to being good, but at the very beginning, they just take a flintlock pistol, aim it directly down, and blow off all their toes. Yep. Now run this 100-meter dash. Do I, we have more specific points on the racism? Because I only have the one more. Uh, let me check. Because I, uh, I will be honest. I didn't write anything specific down about racism. But every time something explicitly racist happened, I underlined the word racism in my notes. Uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight underlines, and it's circled. Oh, here. I have some of the lines of dialogue that she said about Indians. Oh, you wrote them down? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. She goes, and I quote, you really want us to be living scalped among savages? What did I tell you about talking to those dirty, filthy Indians? We rewound the film at that point because we were only half paying attention in that second. And I heard it. And I was like, you need to rewind the film so everyone can hear this. Like minutes before Yancey goes on this beautiful tirade about how we should treat Cherokees equal. Dirty, filthy Indians. Also, on top of that, dirty, filthy Indians. Still inaccurate. Native Americans, no one was near India at all at any point in the movie. I get so annoyed when people call Native Americans Indians. Yeah. Right. If you genuinely fuck up and go, my bad, this. Yeah. I completely understand. Old habits. Yeah. A lot of people live with parents that say things like that. And you have to, you especially, we have to unlearn those habits. Yeah. So fucking up is understandable. Dude, even, even sometimes I will fuck up and I get it modern mm. we are almost a hundred years removed from this film we're 90 years removed from the film actually exactly so a lot has changed 
And it's just, it's frustrating to see a film where something this early is trying to make a statement, but has its head so far up its own ass that it doesn't understand that it is gimping itself and is unable to actually say this. Yeah, Yeah, people fuck up still nowadays, but like, it's tough. It's tough watching a film with this level of just blind ignorance. Because you know that the people behind this film didn't believe in some of these messages. Oh, absolutely. Because of how the characters are portrayed. Why did he look like that? Isaiah's hair at the beginning of the movie. Like, it was just... I I really actually kind of want to talk about... um, This is kind of... We could consider a final point because it adds another kind of angle to it. Um, I don't want to say it's something that keeps me up at night, but it kind of does in a sense. It's more like... Okay, so there's an interesting contemporary angle to it. 100 years ago, words like, I don't know, retard, for example, that we couldn't say today. I can. I, I, have, I was diagnosed. You have the hard R pass. I have the hard R pass. I was diagnosed. I got to say that. <laughs> yeah, you e-tard. Re- yeah, <laughs> soft R. Uh, no, so that no. word, like I was just watching The Twilight Zone the other day, and they were talking about the protagonist's little girl for, I forget the episode. She was like, oh, no, it's not we. It's a supernatural problem. But they're like, it's not this. No, she's not retarded or anything. We don't know what the problem is. It, it's kind of casually used yes whereas today in our lens we are mentally challenged it's highly offensive to call someone that word yeah whereas back then it was just a term they, yeah yeah that dates that was so, the medical term you know mm-hmm. what else was moron that is a medical term like that's hun- also like the most tame thing you it, can call somebody what are you a moron right but today it yeah. only means just like an offensive idiot thing you yeah know, I it, know it what doesn't you mean. it doesn't mean anything medical or just doctor related at all so well un- unlearning things like that is part of life. Well, my whole point is that, yeah, there's plenty of shit in Cimarron that, like, by today's standards are awful. What a hundred years from now are we saying on this very show that someone then is going to go, wow, these fucking out-of-touch people saying words like that? Uh, I'll around. give you a hint. We call each other retarded all the time. We do. Right, but I give you guys the art fast. That's a little different. But I, I do see your point about that. I do see your point because there are other things that, like, let's. what's a really tame one? Idiot. Fridge. Fridge, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't believe they said he got in the fridge. He got in the fridge, yeah. That's uh, me. <laughs> no, let's let's just say idiot. Like that's the most tame shit. You I could mean, possibly... we call each other bitch all the time. Bitch, too. They, that's a great example. We call each other bitch all the time. What if like 50, 60, 70 years from now that becomes like on the level of something really offensive? I've experienced that before. I got in high school. I got detention because I told someone to stop being a bitch. Okay. Specifically, I got it because she was a female. Hmm. And I said, don't be a bitch. Uh, yeah, that's derogatory towards women. The, the yeah. reason I called her a bitch is because she flipped me off. I said, don't be a bitch, Sam. Okay, okay. I, I, well, I guess that's kinda... My point is, though, let me finish with this. She didn't get a detention for flipping me off. Fair. Well, yeah. well, Not yeah. fair! No! I, I, no. I, I... <laughs> I'm still mad about this. <laughs> I've been out of high school and college for a while now, and I'm still mad. Mud on his soapbox. Fair enough. Well, I mean, it's the kind of thing where, looking back... We, the three of us, can never know what someone in the future will think of your situation. What if bitch is 50, 60, 70 years from now as bad as the, as bad as the N-word? We wouldn't know. We can't know that. We don't know what the future is going to look like. You're right. So the people making Cimarron thought they were perfectly okay. <laughs> well, My problem is not with them calling them Indians or anything. That's fine. My That's whatever. Is- My problem with this is they... They make, like, the centerpiece, the climax of the film about people accepting Cherokees and stuff. And then they treat the black characters the way they do. Yeah. No, that's what I was saying, too. Like, that's the lack of self-awareness. It's hypocritical. But also, I'm pretty sure that even in the 30s, people knew racism was wrong. Well, this got amazing reviews. Uh, I, I, Ian? I don't Mud, know about that. Mud, uh, they there just a fought certain, a civil war. <laughs> there was a certain group of people on the rise in this little country in Europe called Germany. I'm just saying <laughs> that even even though it was more socially accepted, people still knew that it wasn't like you're right. right. I mean, there are people who have always known that racism is wrong. That's how we get you know people who help push uh, agendas along. If I could add but something. that being said. No. Right. Okay, if I could add something, I would probably... Maybe I'm just being... Hold on. You're no, being optimistic. No, you have a point, but I would say, slightly siding with Mud, that racism was probably as bad as jaywalking in the 30s. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not right, you shouldn't do it, but we all just kind of do it all the time anyway. Like, that's, how, that's what the 30s mentality is. I don't think as many people were jaywalking as being racist. I don't think as many people were thinking that jaywalking was 
bad. My point is... They liked it? <laughs> yeah. Well, most people aren't self-aware enough to be like, this is a bad thing. My point it's is just it's the, like on par as like not important, whereas today yeah, it's like the people most didn't important. think about it. Yeah. You yeah. know, what I'm saying is people who were racially aware... That sounds weird. People who were like not racist were definitely the minority in the 30s. Yes. And there's no way around it. Yeah. Because right. if they right. weren't, we wouldn't have needed a lot of shit that came out after the 30s you're right you're right i i optimism but at the same uh, time realism i th- no i was being optimistic i know i'm saying i was being real. but i think that deep down when you think even if you are a racist i think you you're well aware that it's like you have this prejudice for almost no reason like there has to be no they they're not that they're not that self-aware man trust I, me i, I know i've met and talked to plenty of racist people in my life they're not self-aware enough. I can't, I just can't imagine it, I guess. It's hard for us can't. to imagine it. The same way it's hard for them to imagine that we're not racist. I guess I just can't put myself in that mindset. Because I Well, that's a good thing. That way. That's a good thing. It's cool that you are self-aware enough to know that you're not in that mindset enough to understand how they are. That's interesting. I can't understand it. I really can't. How can you just be like... People of different color. Because a lot of people like. Because so that's simple. just how it was. Well, like you got to think about it this way too. Like a lot of people who even aren't racist would still yeah. be so convicted in what they believe that they cannot even. Even people who are not racist sometimes they can't even understand why people would be racist, which is totally understandable because it's a really stupid mentality. But it's just interesting when someone goes, "Yeah, no, I, I just, I cannot even get into that mindset, and I'm just aware of that, and I'm just gonna move on with my life." I feel like we're tangenting now into a place that's far and away from yeah, the film. I, I don't know. How I much think the- we've made our point of this film would be a lot better if it had a little more self awareness of what it was saying about race. I agree completely. Or no self awareness and not have the race in it. Not See, have. But then it would issues. just be fucking boring. Fair, fair. But like yeah. those those issues that arise with adding that character in in that time period without knowing how to handle a character like that in that time period is just hilariously bad. Whereas, I don't know, Wings or Broadway Melody, they don't they aren't racist films. Because there's no minorities. There's no like you can't even possibly miswrite a Listen, character. Listen, the one thing is in Wings they hate crowds, but like that's the war. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Germany. That's yeah. War is war. War is war. <laughs> war is war. <laughs> but uh yeah. So I guess to wrap up out of ten, and again to tie back to our philosophical points, I we all can't put our heads in the mindset of someone who is a racist and likes it and is outwardly racist about it. But at the end of the day, we're all sitting here saying, okay, what's my opinion of the movie? And from my perspective, who is not a racist human being, at least I like to think so, I'm going to give it a one. Wow, that's I that's really low. Strongly dislike this movie. Damn, all right. I, I can't say I dislike it. It's bad. It's bad. It's a bad film. I can say that, but the first half of this film is solid in certain parts. I'm going to go with a four, because okay. I think this film's better than Broadway Melody. Ian? Yeah, I, I can I can say it's definitely better than Broadway Melody from like a film perspective. Um, I think it'd be like a five or a six if the racism wasn't such a big factor. But the fact that the racism undercuts, I think my favorite part of the movie, really, really deters me from giving it a positive score. Um, I was, I was still gonna say four, yeah, because I think it's better four than Broadway to me Melody. Is when you start to get into negative as a film, mm-hmm. but the biggest theme, which is that church scene, man, that church scene is the best scene in the movie, and then it completely gets undercut. See, the thing is, that's I, a shame. I agree with you guys, but the yeah. fact that it is undercut, I almost don't even want to give it credit for that scene since it's in the same movie as everything else. Like, I can, yeah. I can say that one scene in isolation is actually pretty cool and interesting, but then as soon as the parts before and the parts after it kind of conflict. It's like, well, what does that matter? Like, for example, and this is a really weird thing to talk about, best pictures about, but in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, the <laughs> film, remember the nightmare sequence? Yeah, that's fucking useless. It's a great scene. Isolated. But it, it's got nothing to do with the film. Nothing to do with the film. The film contradicts it at certain points. It's got, it, it's completely irrelevant. You take it out, the movie's improved. Even Ooh. though I love that scene. So it's, it's just really annoying to me to see that one sequence, the, the fucking church scene, and other smaller spits like that that actually add to the themes and messages of the movie completely get thrown out the window by the rest of the film, which is why I have to go such a negative, harsh score at one. Jake bringing up BVS during the review. Why did you say that movie name? <laughs> All right, let's exactly let's let's, let's shut the fuck up. Um, yeah. Jake, what's on the roster for next week, I'll man? I'll tell you. Before we finish, updated, best and worst. It's still, for me, All Quiet on the Western Front's the best, 
Broadway melody's the worst. I agree, but Jake. All Quiet and the Western Front is the best, and the worst is Cimarron. I'm glad that we're only four in, and we're already starting to get some divergence in our lists. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Honestly. Yeah. I'm glad. Um, I was worried, because sometimes, sometimes, as much as we like to think we have differing opinions, sometimes our lists align a little too well, much. Well, a lot of the time, we disagree strongly and then give a movie one point off of each other. That's always fun. That We've joked there's a 10-mile gap between seven and eight. Six and seven. Six, Six and seven. seven. So if I have a seven, you have a six, we'll have like a full-blown debate. We will have like a 40-minute argument, and then you'll go seven, and I'll go six. Doctor Sleep, six, five. Yeah, check out Doctor our Sleep Doctor Sleep was a huge. Do- check out our Doctor Sleep review for the biggest like yeah, argument One over point nothing. argument ever. Jake gave it a seven. Ian and I gave it a six. Ian and I strongly disliked that movie. Jake liked it. I also want to say something else, too. We're humans. A lot of people watch a movie, give it a rating, and move on as if that's like concrete and never changing. We will change our opinions. We That's like... true. Mud liked the beach bum at one point. He it's did. true. I'll give you a great example. Thunderball, a James Bond movie we reviewed for the channel. When we watched it, we gave it sixes and sevens, and then we watched You Only Live Twice and gave it higher scores than that. However, as things went on and we thought more about it, Thunderball became our favorite James Bond film over You Only Live Twice. Yeah. Like, I, I would give that a nine today. Yeah. Humans can change their minds because as time goes on, we might reflect on things or watch things again and go, oh, well, I was wrong. Or, oh, I feel stronger about this or less strongly about that. Yeah. So who knows? Some wrong could be a 10 out of 10 in 10 fucking episodes. You know? But that's not going to happen. But no. it could change from my one position I have it on under the bottom rung. Yeah. So just the way you feel about the movie, a movie the first time you watch it is not how you're going to feel about it the second time. Exactly. Nope. That's a simple fact. So. so, Jake, with all that, again, yeah, what's next? On what are we watching to? next week? I'll tell you. It is the fifth best picture of all time. No. It, yeah. Well, that. five comes after four. After the fourth one. It is Grand Hotel. Is that a prequel to the Grand, Grand Budapest, Budapest Hotel? Hotel? <laughs> we finna do this shit like this. It's like. Uh, Get it? His pants fell off. I fucking hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Changed into just a f- what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, that's his head. What the fuck? No, was his head. That? Got, his head got cut off. By that logic, every part of a transformer is like the thing. No, I think it's like just the head part. It's so why thing. isn't Jazz still alive? I don't fucking know. His head's dude. fine. His head's perfect. Are they gonna fuck on top of Bumblebee? Yes. Is that a threesome? That's the implication here. Ratchet and Ironhide are watching. Yeah, voyeurism. Wait, we, 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 full <laughs> we've been talking about this. Optimus is also watching. Oh, <laughs> this is so weird. He's recording it and broadcasting it to the stars. Oh, don't make me spray my lubricant. I got to paint a picture for you. You're Hasbro. Do you sue? Uh, wait, I'll wait till after no, the movie to decide. It's not worth it. That title card, though. Discovered life on another planet. It's the same opening! Captured across the galaxy, when hoping to find it life and rebuild a message of peace. What 2003 video game is this from? Our clouds. Oh, oh my god! Holy Whoa. fuck! Whoa! <laughs>